Come and meet the people. And we are co-hosting this uh, panel discussion with the Social Justice Council here at First Unitarian Church. I want to thank CAM TV for being here and recording. Uh, um, for those of you that are in the audience, uh, there's some refreshments back there. Feel free to get up at any time and, and get some. Uh, we ask that we will have a question and answer session toward the end. We ask that you hold your questions until then. I know that, that we have an excellent panel here. Some of them are on opposing sides. And so I'm asking that uh, you guys as the audience, please ask questions, not try to convince the panel that your idea is correct. Uh, sometimes <laughs> we, we have a problem with that, that we get caught up in. I want to give you my opinion. We'd really like you to pull information from these people instead of trying to convince them that you know their, their point of view was not what yours is. <laughs> so. And we've asked the panelists to do the same as well, so that they can ask each other questions if they have questions, but not try to convince them that you know this way is right and that way is wrong. The uh, purpose of our panel discussions is to give you guys as much information as possible so that you can form your own opinions, not us try to tell you what you should be thinking. So we're going to go ahead and get started. The panel discussion is on uh, the American election system and uh, democracy. However, we decide to define that, and the panelists will be defining it in their, their own ways. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce, uh, down at the end, I have Eric Cohn. Did I pronounce that right? Cohn, oh, Eric Cohn, correct. Uh, he is the CEO of Curious Task Strategies Incorporated, and has been committing politics professionally since 2001. A veteran of numerous political campaigns and grassroots activist organizations. Eric currently serves as the Communications Director for the Chicago Tea Party Patriots. He is also Vice Chairman of the Chicago Chapter of America's Future Foundation in Chicago, an organization dedicated to identifying and cultivating the next generation of classical liberal leaders in the Windy City. Right. Next to him, we have Dr. Michael Macy. Uh, he's from the Political Science Department at DePaul. He is uh, he teaches courses on elections, the Congress, the presidency, and comparative legislative behavior. He is the former dean of DePaul's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. He has written extensively on legislatures around the world, the United States Congress, and about the relationship between the Congress and the President of the United States. His books include Comparative Legislatures, Congress, the President, and Public Policy, and Representative Democracy. He is currently at work on a book that examines the American presidency from a comparative perspective. Next to him, we have Alan Lindrup, who is from here at the Social Justice Council of the First Unitarian Church. He is ending his, uh, or near the end, of his three-year term as chair of the Social Justice Council. And I have to say that he has done an excellent job. And we work pretty well together. Um, he became an avid follower of public affairs and politics in 1960 when he was 11 years old. He began getting involved with social justice activities, such as demonstrating against segregation in the Chicago public schools while in high school. He did his first political work in 1968, working for Senator Eugene McCarthy in the Wisconsin primary and Senator Robert Kennedy in the Indiana primary. He had a 35-year career with the U.S. Social Security Administration and is now retired. Throughout his adult life, he has been a social justice activist and has also done some work in political campaigns. Um, right over here, we have Jim Allen. He is from the Board of Election Commissioners for the City of Chicago. He has been a news reporter for 15 years covering city government and the courts, politics, and events like the 1996 Democratic National Convention and the Chicago Bulls Championships. He then worked seven years as Assistant Cook County Treasurer, streamlining refund, internet, billing, and payment systems. In, De in December 2006, he joined the Board of Election Commissioners for the City of Chicago to manage voter communications, web systems, and correspondence. Next to him is Julie Samuels from the Illinois Green Party. Uh, her background is in community organizing on issues of social and environmental justice. She has worked as a solid waste toxic special toxics specialist with Citizens for a Better Environment, statewide coordinator for the Affordable Budget Coalition, as tenant co-op management research consultant for Bigger Dyke Redevelopment Corporation and has been community garden organizer in Chicago since 1994. She also served six years as an at-large member and vice president of the statewide Illinois Environmental Council. 
Julie is currently a board member of the Safer Pest Control Project and the Chicago Recycling Coalition. She also is vice chair of the Illinois Green Party, has run twice for the position of state representative, and for lieutenant governor with Rich Whitney in his 2006 gubernatorial campaign. And last, but definitely not least, we have Bill House. And right here. He is with the Socialist Party USA. Uh, he is the former international secretary of the party. He is a professor of history and political science at Elgin Community College and has published widely. His most recent book is Karl Marx, A World to Win, and his most recent article is The Condition of the Workers of the World in the Era of Globalization. Growing up in Chicago's Englewood, na Englewood neighborhood, Pulse aspired to be a CTA bus driver, but had to settle for being a professor. <laughs> Some of the questions, not everyone is going to be answering them, so uh, we'll just kind of ask for whoever wants to talk first. Uh, just like Marco said, uh, make sure that you use the microphone. It's for the it's for the recording, and uh, so try and speak up. Uh, <laughs> even when we have the microphones, they tend to not uh, cooperate with us very much in, in this room. So, so our first question: What is your group's stance on elections? Or if you only represent uh, a particular way of thought in your group or party, uh, please describe that stance and briefly how it differs from the rest of your party or group. So I'm going to start down the end with Eric. Uh, thank you to the Company of the People and the Unitarian Church for having me and all of us here. Um, I'm pro elections. I think it's a rather good idea. Uh, but I'm going to add some caveats to that. Uh, the first, and I may be skipping ahead a little bit, but I, I feel necessary to do it. In the title of the program, um, it says uh, it's about Americans' elections and democracy. Um, it's a word that gets used interchangeably with a lot of other words. Uh, America is not a democracy. It's not intended to be a democracy, and I don't think we would want it to be a democracy. Um, sometimes, and I'm in the Chicago Tea Party, never really was much into protesting, but uh, sometimes I like to go down and see the, um, the protests downtown. I always enjoy when I hear uh, one of my favorite, you know, the, the chanting is kind of fun. Um, I always enjoy to hear that. This is what democracy looks like. And that is technically correct. Democracy is a mob. Uh, in a democracy, 50% plus one people, uh, people can vote to piss in the cornflakes of the other 49%. As Benjamin Franklin um, once said, and I enjoy this quote, a democracy is two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for lunch. Uh, America is a constitutional republic, and that's rather important. Uh, it's a constitutional republic that is, uh, the Constitution serves as a charter of negative liberties to protect the rights of the minority so that if 50% of one plus one people decide that they want to you know, have fun with their cornflakes, they're not allowed to. So I agree that elections are a good thing, and they're a good thing under the understanding which we have them in this country, um, in a constitutional republic, in a, a pure democracy. Elections can be a good thing, but it's not necess as necessarily so. Thank you all. So, Julie, um, I don't have a group, but I guess my group are, are political figures and theorists people like that, so, and as you would imagine, uh, they don't have any consensus on this issue. Uh, the uh, elections are, uh, have been uh, criticized by both the left and the right, uh, as Bill will talk perhaps more about, uh, our mutual friend Karl Marx uh, thought that elections were a periodic opportunity for citizens to decide who among the ruling class will misrepresent them. Uh, in one of his more, uh, one of his more negative moments, he phrased it as per periodic opportunities for slaves to, uh, to pick their masters. Uh, the uh, modern theorists uh, argue on the left as well that elections are a form of thin democracy. Uh, by that they mean that they reduce the citizen to simply a spectator in the political process with at most a yearly opportunity to participate and that these, uh, that these exercises are dominated by people with money and power. 
On the right, uh, going back to those who uh, wrote our Constitution, Madison and most of the founders criticized elections from a more conservative uh, perspective. Ma Madison worried about the vicious arts by which elections are too often won and feared the rise of demagogues who would manipulate the people. Uh, you have to remember that uh, in the Constitution they created in Philadelphia, only one half of one branch of the federal government was to be elected by the people. And even then, a very restricted definition of people, a white male property holders. And even then, they didn't trust the more than one, one half of uh, one, one of the branches of the government. Um, election, direct election of the president, they, they rejected out of hand. George Mason of Virginia said, giving the people the choice of the president uh, was like referring a trial of colors to a blind man. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is no national right to vote in the Constitution. Uh, the word vote, the, the voting is not guaranteed in the original document. Simply uh, all left to the states, and what, however the states define uh, the right to vote. Nevertheless, given that, the founders believed that representative government uh, was preferable to a democracy, which they viewed as a direct, as direct rule by the people, uh, something that, that frightened them. Uh, Roger Sherman of Connecticut at the convention, the people should have as little to do as may be about the government. They want information and are constantly liable to be misled. William Livingston of New Jersey, the people have ever been and ever will be unfit to retain the exercise of power in their own hands. Uh, and James Madison, uh, the so-called father of the Constitution, uh, endorsed representative government as sort of you know, a safeguard. He said at least you would, you would uh, filter the views of the people through a group of uh, more intelligent uh, a, uh, people who would refine the views of the public and would make it more likely that, that the, the policies adopted would be uh, more consonant with the, uh, with the uh, general, general good. Uh, so again, you know, the, on the left, there's a concern that, that elections are simply exercises dominated by those with power. On the right, a concern that elections reduce uh, politics to a lowest common denominator in which uneducated citizens uh, make uneducated choices about a complex policy issues. I'm sure we'll get to some of the other questions later on. Obviously, as the first two speakers have said, the, our form of democracy is a representative democracy, not a direct democracy. But we have come far as far as being able to increase the, the franchise, the ability to vote through the you know, 200 plus years of our existence. Uh, but we could do more. Uh, even at this point, there are efforts in some state legislatures to uh, restrict some voting privileges through requiring voter IDs. Uh, even though this has not been established by a lot of the evidence that there's a major problem that this is trying to solve, it's more a possible or speculative problem as far as being something substantial. Efforts that would increase uh, the ability to vote through, for example, uh, holding elections on uh, weekend dates, allowing and having all states allow for early elections. Uh, we know now Illinois has moved in that direction, but not all states have the same procedures. We used to have required, we had to establish good cause for voting early. The more things that we can do that will allow more people the ability to fit voting into their schedules, because many people are busy and they don't want to stay in the long lines or whatever, so to the extent it's easier to do so, that increases democratic participation. Uh, some states trying things like, you know, electronic voting, voting by mail, all kind of other procedures, and Providing there's sufficient safeguards, I think anything that will increase uh, the opportunity and encourage people to participate in elections uh, will make for better elections. We've come away, but we have way more to go. Yep. Uh, well, as the spokesman for the Chicago Board of Election Commissioners, I can tell you that the position of the board is that we're very supportive. <laughs> 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 we, we believe in very strong. At last. <laughs> um, but getting to the question at hand, as the other speakers have mentioned, I won't bore you with the details, but America is a republic, um, not a, a democracy. And uh, I think 
some of the founding fathers' fears were, were well grounded. Uh, if we look at uh, if we look at California, which probably comes the closest to becoming a direct democracy through the ballot initiatives that they offer, often called propositions, uh, we see sometimes the electorate has a, a strong tendency to elect uh, to make selections that are contradictory, where they impose a requirement on their government to provide a set of services, and then in the very next proposition they say you cannot have the revenue that you need to perform those services, and as a result they're one of the, the, the steeper uh, insolvency cases about to happen. Um, that said, uh, we, we have much more work to do in terms of becoming more inclusive. Uh, what we strive for in Chicago, and believe it or not, we are now a model uh, that, that are copied and by other jurisdictions looking for ways to reform. We're not your father's Board of Election Commissioners. We're not 1960. Uh, we, uh, we go through, uh, we're going through a, a, a recount, for example, right now, where they're exhaustively, uh, where the, the loser in the contest is going through several targeted precincts, where the margin was tilted toward the person who appears to have won. And after going through all of these votes, after going through all the absentee applications, after all the early voting, everything, they may have changed the margin by one. Where, and it was a, a clerical error where a ballot was not marked right by the, the voter. So they, instead of connecting the arrow, they indicated their choice by circling the name. So there was no mechanical flaw. There was no, we have a lot more integrity in our system now as a result of the, the overall uh, disgust with what happened in 2000 in Florida. Uh, it's why we went from having a recount in 1982 in a seemingly tight gubernatorial race between Adlai Stevenson and Jim Thompson when there was a 5,000 vote margin statewide. And just two years ago, we had a primary where Bill Brady and Kurt Dillard were just 200 votes apart statewide and Diller made the determination that there was no way they could overcome that. That was now insurmountable. So I, we can talk more about what has changed and why that has, uh, why it's that way now more, but uh, overall, uh, the board's position is that we need to build systems that are more inclusive, as well as being transparent and fair, uh, and administered by independent authorities, uh, ultimately the courts. But, uh, at the same time, uh, we have situations with uh, the law right now that are not conducive to becoming fully inclusive. We can talk about that later. There are some great reports by the Q Center for the states. Uh, Chicago mirrors the nationwide problem right now, and that is 24% of the U.S. citizens who are voting age are not registered at all. We have another 400,000 citizens we could add to our voter rolls of 1.3 million right now, just in the city of Chicago, who are not registered and will not be. So when you see a voter turnout rate of 50%, it actually turns out to be closer to about 40%, 38%, because there's a big chunk of people who are just not part of the franchise right now. And we can talk more a little later about voter ID requirements, about uh, same-day registration, but we can get to that later. <coughs> First of all, I want to say I'm really impressed by the credentials of the people on this group. Um, the research, the information you have is, I'm expecting and have already learned a lot. Um, the question that we were asked is, what is your group's stance on elections? So I'm just going to say, we believe in elections. We ought to believe in elections. We try awfully darn hard to run in them. Uh, we have, we spend almost all of our time and all of our resources doing that. We run into stone walls all the time, however, and I intend to talk more about the details of that. So then I just, uh, that's the answer to the question, and then I just want to say two other things. One is that what happens in California with those propositions is hardly what I would call democracy. I would call that it goes to the highest bidder, which is a problem that we certainly have in everything we try to do, and which is, I think, the problem with our democracy. So if you had enough money in the last proposition races, as I understand it, 
you could get all the people you wanted out there passing the petitions and convincing people to do anything. So frankly, money is the problem. And so I just want to take the rest of my time to tell people about the Green Party, because I think that there are people who don't know the Green Party. Um, I guess I'm kind of one of the kind of person that is part of the Green Party, old 60s survivor, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and there's more of them, but there are also a lot more young people and we're working on really developing campus greens. Uh, the Green Party, we feel, is the only real alternative to the Republicrats. We work to educate voters about what legislators do and how they affect their lives. I would say do and don't do. Um, we encourage real people to run for office, like me. I'm just a real person. I ain't rich. I ain't got no power. I just have a job. I go to work every day. I have a family live in a house and paid the mortgage off early because I'm extremely frugal. So that's, uh, that's the kind of people we want to run for office. And you notice I've run for office several times. I'm a loser. You may as well know that too. <laughs> uh, now, so we don't want those who are, who can be controlled by money and power or narrow, narrow social agendas. I can't find anything more irritating than narrow social agenda. They're going to run out like two issues when there's a thousand issues out there that are so critical that we should be addressing. Uh, we take no money from corporations, not a dime, not a nickel, not a penny. We do not take money from corporations. Uh, we have platforms based on our 10 key values, so I always come prepared with material. I have a lot of these. If you want to learn about us, it's all in here, so I'm not going to give you too many more details. Um, and so what we really do expect is that the people who will be a part of our party are going to run on these values and they're going to work on these values and make them happen once they are elected. So this is why I'm with the Green Party, this is why the Green Party exists. Thank you. Okay, first of all I'd like to say that although I'm representing the Socialist Party of the United States, I'm also just speaking as an individual. There are many socialist uh, points of view within the Socialist Party. There are many different groups that consider themselves socialists. So anything I say is going to be my, my own point of view, my interpretation. I, for example, think that it's probably a mistake sometimes for socialist groups to run their own little campaign. It would be better if we had some sort of broad election front. So, for example, I've been known, I hate to admit it to the camera, but I vote green. <laughs> okay, so now that that's out of the way, uh, yeah. under, under bad advice in a previous job, I voted for Bill Clinton in 1992, and I still lose sleep over that, so thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, and in any case, uh, on the question of elections, I'm very much in favor of elections, which may be a minority position on this panel, I'm sure, uh, but because I think that if you look at it empirically, as bad as elections can be, under the proper circumstance, finance control, honest elections, of course, ballot access, and all those various things, they beat all the alternatives. They beat the alternative of a hereditary monarchy. They beat the alternative of competing, rotating elites that change. In other words, all the other possible systems of government that you could implement that do not have open and free and completely democratic elections, I think you can prove empirically are inferior to having free and democratic elections. And that is the position of almost everyone I know who calls themselves a socialist. 